uh, let's start today's lecture of fundamentals of optical coherence tomography. And today is day four, and it is about a wavelength selection of OCD and also the depth range of OCD. Okay, so we have now uh, today, uh, today we have two topics. One is the selection of the wavelength. It's a kind of a system designing issue. And the depth range is a system property issue. And surely this is associated with the design of the OCD itself. Okay, let's start uh, from the wavelength selection. Okay, uh, the probe wavelength uh, of the OCD is normally the near infrared, right? Uh, around 840 or 1.3 microns, uh, sorry, 840 nanometers or 1.3 microns. So, but uh, how do you select the wavelength range? A wavelength band, say. It, uh, uh, the first question of today, and there is actually a certain start strategy for this, and mostly uh, it depends on the absorption of the water, especially for the near infrared range. See on. Um, so this part of the table. Uh, first, forget about this. Uh, this column. Just concentrate on this. It's a near infrared, 830 nanometer. Is uh, sometimes you can see it as a red light, but uh, some cases we cannot see it. It's nearly the border between the visible light and the infrared. We call it as a near a near infrared. And a 1.04 micron, uh, or say 1040 nanometers or 1050 nanometers, uh, it's already in the uh, near infrared. We cannot see it. Uh, Technically speaking, if we focus it on the retina, we can see it, uh, but uh, normally we consider it, it is invisible. OK, and a 1.310 is even, uh, we call it as an eye safe. We cannot see it, surely. So uh, normally OCD uses one of these three bands, 830 nanometer, 1040 or 1050. We call it as a, a one micron band, a one micron band. Uh, or 1.3. Now, why we selected one of from D3 only? Actually, it depends on, uh, okay, there are two reasons, but the main reason is the absorption of the water. Okay, the uh, not small amount of, a small amount of the, the human body was consisting of water. So the water is a main absorber in the human body. So if the light is highly absorbed by the water, we cannot, the light cannot reach to the deep region of the tissue. So we need to avoid the high absorption of the water. So it is always a good strategy to select the local minimum of the water absorption. That's a way of thinking. And here is a, a water absorption graph as a function of the wavelength. OK, and here we see a sum of the minima, local minima, or local minima, sorry. Uh, here, the one is here, it's very distinct, 830, around 830 nanometer. There is a local minima, local minima, sorry. Okay, uh, surely we can use it. The other local minima, uh, the other major one is here, it's around 1.31. And technically, the local minima is somewhere here, but uh, we normally use a 1.3 or 1.31 microns. I I'm going to explain the reason why, a uh, reason why later. Okay, and the other local minima is around here, 1.05 microns, 750 nanometers. Okay, uh, let's see one by one. In the uh, early OCT, uh, like 90, 1991, Fujimoto, David one was based on an 800 nanometer wave, uh, wavelength band. Okay, so this means 800 or 830 nanometer band is the first uh, wavelength band of the OCD. And uh, uh, as you can see in this graph, it has very low absorption of the water. So it's quite easy to reach to the deep region of the tissue. And especially, uh, maybe some of you remember uh, in the first lecture of this, this series, uh, I talked about the first paper of OCT 1991, Science, David Kwan and James Fujimoto. And in that paper, they demonstrated the retinal imaging 
okay, the posterior part of the eye. And that is the first demonstration of the OCD. And also on uh, the retinal imaging is the first industrially successful application of OCD, uh, both industrially and also the clinically, a double perspective. Anyway, so um, the eye has a certain length. It's around 2.4 centimeters. So this means when, you, uh, when we want to measure or image the posterior part of the eye, like retina, the light should pass through the whole length of the eye. It's 2.4 millimeters, uh, sorry, centimeters. Even it's double path means it's a, it should be doubled, 4.8, uh, 2.4 centimeters for a single bath and uh, 4.8 centimeters for double bath. Okay, and the eye, um, say most of the part of the eye is occupied by uh, something like a gel. It is called a vitreous and it is nearly like water. So the uh, nearly 100% of the constituent of it is water. So this means the main absorber of the eye or vitreous or even some kind of fluid like an aqueous humor is water. So this means water is uh, uh, mainly or, uh, and, uh, or nominally only one absorber in the water, uh, in, the, in the eye, okay? Uh, or say eye optics. So the point is there is a water and the light should pass through around the five centimeters of the water before image of the retina. So this means we need to maximize the absorption of the water. Otherwise, we cannot detect the signal. Okay, that's the point. So uh, their selection of the wavelength is to minimize the water absorption. That was 830 nanometers. Okay. And uh, we also can think about a shorter wavelength, but uh, I'm going to talk about it uh, later. It's a kind of uh, very new, one of the newest wavelength band utilizing our CT visible. So just forget about it at, at this moment. Forget about it for now. Okay, so 830 nanometer has some certain property. As I've explained, the water absorption is quite low. Okay, and uh, the penetrate, but the penetration to the tissue is low. That the next point. Uh, when you think about the absorption, uh, sorry, about when you think about the, the imaging depth of the eye, you need to think about on uh, two issues associated with the probe wavelength selection. One is the absorption, and the other is scattering. Okay, the light penetrate into the tissue as it is scattered. And if the light is highly affected, uh, too much highly affected by the tissue, it is just scattered out at the surface or the uh, superior part of the tissue and it cannot reach to the deep region of the tissue, right? So we need to, at uh, first, minimize the absorption. And at the same time, we need a good balance of the scattering. If the scattering is too low, we cannot, uh, we cannot detect the signal because the light is not scattered back. But if the scatter is too strong, we cannot image the deep region because all of the light was just scattered out at the surface, okay? And 830 nanometer has a uh, uh, low absorption and a high scattering. Actually, in general, on uh, the scattering of the light is uh, inverse, it's not inversely proportional, but uh, something like a even, uh, it is associated with the wavelength in the power of minus two to minus four. When you, uh, when you increase the wavelength more and more, you have a lesser and lesser scattering, okay? Uh, maybe uh, for students, uh, you can imagine that, that in a sunset, the sun is red, right? But uh, when it's uh, at front of you, it, around noon, it is white, sun is white. Why it happens? It's because of the, uh, the scattering of the atmosphere. Now, at, uh, if the sun is on top of you, the path 
from uh, the atmosphere path, path, the light path in the atmosphere is quite short, right? So in this case, uh, the short wavelength and the long wavelength, both of them are not that much scattered. But at the sunset, it should penetrate for a long uh, distance in the atmosphere. So in this case, the blue light, I mean the short wavelengths, are well scattered in comparison to the red light. So the only the red light arrive alive and the reach to you. So that's the reason of why you see the sun as red. And at the noon, actually, even the blue light is more scattered than uh, red light. That's the reason why uh, you you see the sky is blue. Okay. So the same thing can be happened with the OCD. The shorter wavelength is well scattered or more scattered. Shorter, uh, the shorter wavelength, more scattered by the tissue. And it results in a, a stronger signal, but a shorter penetration. And uh, normally, in our case, shorter pe penetration is more problematic. Okay, so uh, let's go back to 830 particular case. The absorption of the water is low, but the scattering is high. It results in a low penetration. And the perfect application of this combination is retina imaging. Okay, as I've explained for the retina imaging, light should pass through the water layer uh, around the five centimeters. So the penetration should be minimum. And at the same time, actually the retinal scattering is quite low in comparison to the other tissue. Okay, uh, the retina photoreceptor is at the middle part of the retina, or the, it's actually at the bottom of the sensory retina. The light is coming from this direction, okay? And then uh, it penetrates first the surface layers of the, uh, of the retina, and then detected, I mean, the converted into the electron or voltage. So this means uh, to, uh, to make this eye function well, the retina was evolved to be nearly transparent. Okay, so the scattering is not that much big issue, at least for that uh, uh, superior part of the retina. And that was the original interest of the OCT system. Okay, so the scattering was not a big issue, and at least for the, the first 10, 15 years of the OCT, but the absorption was. So the selection of 830 nanometer is uh, quite, quite reasonable. Okay. And uh, also, in addition, actually, the Fujimoto was uh, originally working for the laser system itself, and he was working for the titanium sapphire laser. And the uh, laser wavelength of the titanium sapphire laser is around 800 nanometers. So that was also a good combination of this. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, maybe it, uh, a little bit out topic of the lecture, but uh, what, what I was very impressed by, uh, say, seeing the history of the OCT development, especially in the MIT, and what I was really impressed is that Fujimoto was a professional of the titanium sapphire laser or auto fast uh, lasers. But uh, once uh, they started to demonstrate the OCT, they were one of the first men who just abandoned the titanium sapphire laser and started to use a superluminescent diode. So they just changed the pivot. They were the laser specialists, but uh, uh, once they became the OCT specialists, they changed the pivot to the OCT from the laser to the OCT and, and uh, rotated their direction and I started to use a super luminous diode. Okay, but uh, at, at the same time, the Fujimoto was also uh, still, uh, he's quite active uh, for the laser system itself. Okay, and anyway, that's the 830 nanometer. Then uh, after demonstrating the 830 nanometer OCT and its retina application, they started to think about the next wavelength. Well, technically, they started to think about the next application, um, like cardiovascular OCD or anterior eye. So for these tissues, the requirement are slightly different than retina. Uh, for the cardiovascular OCD, we need to use the, the endoscope, okay? Cardiovascular endoscope. They put the optical fiber into the, the blood vessel and uh, then take the OCD. So in this case, the light is need, it, it, the light doesn't need to penetrate into the water. There is a certain water that um, 
There is a water, but the water layer is uh, significantly thinner than that of retina. At, but at the same time, the tissue in general in a human body is highly scattering. Exception is only the eye, right? Eye itself is an uh, optical component. Uh, only the optical component in a human body, but a cardiovascular tissue or blood vessels are not. So it is very highly scattering. So now the scattering is a, lot, a bigger issue than the absorption. And how we can solve this issue, how we can get uh, lesser scattering. I've already explained it, right? We need to use the longer wavelength. It's 1.3. And then uh, why it is uh, particularly 1.31 microns. Actually, this is the wavelength band uh, frequently utilized for the optical communication, telecom. Okay, the telecom market is significantly larger, and at least on that time, uh, even maybe now, than the OCT, right? So making anything from the scratch is always not a good idea. We need to utilize or exploit something is existing. It is good for the market-wise and also good for the technical stability-wise, okay? And then uh, they just use the optical components and even theories of the telecom for the OCT. And uh, the good compromise between the telecom and the OCT was the wavelength of 1.31. The other telecom wavelengths of 1.5 was a little bit too long and are too absorbent. Okay, 1.31 was actually a good compromise. There is uh, some small minimum here and uh, significantly less scattering than 830. Okay, and then this one, 1.31 uh, 1 or 1.3, we call it, is uh, uh, the next wavelength of the OCD. It has a high absorption of the water, but a uh, uh, low uh, scattering. It results in high penetration. To the tissue. Okay, uh, if you are a student of OCT lab in Scuba, maybe you can compare two systems within a lab. And uh, surely 1.3, you, you're going to be surprised how 1.3 has a higher penetration than 830 nanometer for non retina tissue. Okay, and uh, actually, this 1.31 has uh, the nanometers have already been quite widely utilized for clinical applications uh, like a cardiovascular OCD and an anterior, eye, anterior eye measurement. Okay, and uh, both of them has, uh, have uh, clinical products and it is widely utilized in a clinic already. Okay, and then around 2007, 8 to 2010, there is another booming of a new wavelength band. It is around one micron. Okay, that's the third wavelength of the OCP. And a one micron wavelength is a kind of compromise between 830 and uh, uh, 1310. Okay, uh, but uh, let me explain about the absorption issue. The first, as you can see in this graph, there is another local minimum of the water absorption. Okay, here, it's around, uh, it's around 1050 nanometers. And also, there is another good property of this wavelength. It's around 1040. It has a local minimum of dispersion. Dispersion degrades the OCD image. I think I've explained it in the second installment of this lecture. And it can be compensated somehow numerically and by the hardware. But in any way, uh, a smaller absorption, uh, sorry, uh, the smaller dispersion is always make the system design ease, easy. Okay, so the uh, dispersion, uh, dispersion minimum is another good point of this uh, one microwave wavelength. The local minimum at uh, uh, 1050, and the local, uh, local minimum of absorption at 1050, and local minimum of dispersion at 1040. Okay, and uh, uh, still the wavelength is long, so the penetration of the tissue is still good. Uh, satisfactory or good? Okay. And uh, the absorption is, I've already explained, it's uh, low. 
by a combination of this high penetration and a low scattering high penetration and a low absorption, actually it can be utilized both for the retina and the cardiovascular or the other tissues. It's a kind of uh, a very, very useful way. And uh, the newest generation, the recent generation of the, the clinical retina OCD system is actually built uh, with a uh, one micron wavelength band. Okay. And uh, also in addition to the retina, with this, we can measure the deeper layers than retina, so-called as choroid or even sclera. It gave us an additional clinical value to the posterior eye or CD system. Okay, these, uh, then these three are the major wavelengths of the OCD system. Then uh, some additional issue about its implementation. In the second installment or first installment of this lecture, uh, lecture series, I've explained about uh, two types of OCT. Uh, one, uh, two types of Fourier domain OCTs. One is spectral domain OCT. This is based on uh, a spectrometer, line camera based spectrometer based OCT system. It's a spectral domain OCT. And the other is a swept source OCT. It is a wavelength sweeping laser based OCT system. Okay. 800 nanometer OCT is mainly implemented with a spectral domain system uh, as a spectral domain system. Okay. And uh, main reason is uh, there is no good sweeping light source at 830 nanometer. Uh, technically speaking, these days we have some, but uh, uh, Still, the spectrometer at this wavelength band is quite, quite competitive in comparison to the sweat source. Okay, so the basic choice for 830 nanometer OCT is a spectral domain OCT. Okay, and then uh, 1310, 1 1.3 micron OCT. It is hard to be implemented with a spectral domain OCT. And why? It's uh, because, because of the limitation, limitation of the camera, line camera. Uh, the cameras are mainly based on silicon technology, but the standard silicon has no sensitivity at the longer wavelength. The border is around one micron. Normal silicon device has no sensitivity at the one micron or longer wavelength. So it cannot be applied for the 1.3 micron OCD system. Okay, and uh, there is a camera of 1.3. It is indium, indium gallium arsenide camera, India's camera, but it is very expensive. Okay, and it cannot be paid as a clinical system. Okay, uh, there is a several demonstrations, including by ourselves. Uh, for the 1.3 spectral domain OCT, but uh, it was um, at least not competitive in comparison to the uh, swept source. Okay, then the swept source. The spectral domain OCT 1.3 micron is hard to be implemented, but a swept source is easier for 1.3 than 830 because of uh, established telecom technologies. Okay, so the sweeping light source was easier to be implemented with a longer wavelength. But uh, a camera is easier to be implemented at 830. Okay, so it made the fate of these technologies. 830 nanometer mainly is implemented in a swept source, but 840, uh, 830 nanometer OCD is implemented in a spectral domain. Okay, and then 1040 or 1050. So as I've explained, uh, the standard silicon camera has no or quite low sensitivity at 1.0 micron. So the standard choice of 1.0 micron OCD is again the swept source. Okay, that's the reason why most of the swept source system, and at least commercially available uh, swept source system, uh, the commercially available, uh, sorry, the most of the 1.0 micron system 
clinically available is built with a web source technology. Okay, so the boundary is here. If the wavelength is shorter than a one micron, it is mostly implemented by the spectral domain OCT. And if the wavelength is longer than one micron, it is implemented with a swept source. Okay. So uh, that was uh, something like a, a story about 10 years ago. But uh, these days, we have uh, something like a new wavelength band. It's a visible OCT. 500 to 700. The absorption of the visible light to the water is very low in comparison to the near infrared. Okay? But a penetration to the tissue is again low. It is quite well scattered. And that's the reason why the beginning of the OCT was starting with uh, near infrared. But uh, uh, gradually we found the visible light is also advantageous to the near infrared in some perspective. The first, we, uh, it gives us a higher resolution, depth resolution, uh, the both depth and the lateral resolution than uh, near infrared light. Okay, maybe it's better to go back to the previous lecture. Yeah, axial resolution. Okay, here is the on uh, the equation of the axial resolution. Uh, you, you can find uh, two factors here, right? The axial resolution is uh, inversely proportional to the wavelength, but at the same time, it is proportional to the uh, second order. Uh, 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 sorry, the, it is proportional to the center wavelength in the power of two. So this means when you use the shorter wavelength, you can dramatically reduce the axial resolution. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the first advantage of the visible light OCT. It is quite easy. Uh, it's not easy, but in principle, uh, it can achieve a significantly higher resolution than the near infrared. And the second reason of why that people interest people are interested in the visible light is uh, its access to the absorption property by using the uh, ultra wide band width as the visible light. We can measure the absorption of the tissue, and the absorption of the tissue is associated with the molecular signature. So the normally OCT is uh, less sensitive for the uh, uh, the OCT has uh, less specificity for the molecule. But by using the, the visible light and the spectroscopic analysis, we have some chance to have uh, molecular specificity by using OCD. Okay, uh, but in, anyway, it's a kind of a new wavelength and uh, not that much utilized at this moment for the clinic. But uh, maybe it's gonna be on a tran um, it's gonna be translated into the clinic sooner or later. And in addition, this visible light OCT is also utilized for the microscopy, OCT microscope. Okay, in the case of OCT microscope, uh, both the axial resolution and the lateral resolution is important. Okay, and the lateral resolution of, in general, the microscopy is in proportional to the wavelength. Okay, the shorter wavelength uh, result in a higher lateral resolution. That's the reason why uh, we use like, the visible light frequently for the OCT microscope. Okay, and uh, surely when you, uh, if you want to use the free domain uh, OCT, the choice is spectral domain OCT because of the limitation of the sensitivity camera. Okay, uh, but the uh, uh, time domain OCT is still a choice for this case, uh, especially for the microscope. Okay, so then uh, that's it uh, for the problem wavelength. It's the uh, first half of today's talk, today's lecture. Okay, so far is it clear for you guys? Then uh, let's go to the uh, second half 
of today's lecture is around uh, it's about the depth range of the OCT. And its depth range of the OCT is limited by the three factors. Okay, the first one is a uh, uh, depth of focus of the scanning optics. As a standard microscopy, as you uh, as you increase the la lateral resolution by increasing the numerical aperture, or in a case of OCD, effective numerical aperture, you are going to have only the limited region you can collect the light. Okay, that the depth of focus it limits the depth imaging range of the OCD. And the uh, uh, next limiting factor of the depth range is the sampling limit. I'm going to elaborate it later. And the third factor is the depth dependent signal decay. As the signal uh, goes farer and farer from the de zero delay of the local humans interferometer, the signal strength becomes lower and lower. It's called as a depth, uh, the, uh, sorry, the depth, the depth dependent signal decay. I'm going to elaborate it later again. Okay, so these three are the residual part of today's lecture. And let's see it one by one. The first limiting factor of the uh, OCT depth imaging range is the depth of focus, but we also call it as a confocality. And it affects all of the spectral domain, swept source, and the TV OCT, time domain OCT. Okay. Uh, the definition of the confocality uh, quite depend, uh, sorry, the property of the confocality quite depend on the system. But uh, here I took uh, one of the famous equation from this textbook. Okay, it's still a little bit arguable, but uh, uh, actually we can accept it. So the confocality of the depth of focus, it is defined as a ray, uh, the double the Rayleigh, lay, uh, double the Rayleigh range is defined by this equation. Okay, the, the first point is here, F divided by D. F is the focal length of the objective, and a D is the beam diameter impinges to that uh, objective. So actually, this factor is in proportional to the effective numerical aperture. Long, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the inverse of that effective numerical aperture. Okay, the longer the wave, uh, longer the focal length increase this this factor, or the numerical aperture. Effective numerical aperture is defined by the inverse of it. So the longer the focal length reduces and increases the effective numerical aperture. Longer the wavelength it reduces. Uh, yeah, sorry, the, the longer uh, the longer the focal length reduces the numerical aperture. Okay, and the more beam diameter increases the numerical aperture. It's just like a standard microscope, a standard objective. So this means uh, this factor is associated with the effective numerical aperture. And when you increase the effective numerical aperture, uh, it's a little bit elaborated. OK, okay so increase the numerical aperture means the decrease of this term, right? This term is in proportional to the uh, inverse of the numerical aperture. By increasing the numerical aperture, this value of the focal length becomes smaller and smaller, even in the factor of two. Okay. So uh, by using the shorter wavelength and the wide, wide, uh, wider beam width, we have uh, only the limited uh, focal depth, and that can be only uh, that the region can be utilized for the imaging. Okay, if the sample or the, the point of interest is significantly farther from the, uh, the focal depth, we cannot capture the light, scattered light. So the OCD signal becomes uh, quite, quite low. Okay, the folk, uh, uh, this one is a confocality issue. Uh, but then maybe you can find out the solution you can use a quite long focal length or only a small D, beam diameter. But in this case, you need to sacrifice the lateral resolution. Lateral resolution 
is uh, inversely, um, the definition is a little bit complicated. Uh, the small resolution means the larger uh, value, right? So uh, maybe you can interpret it in your brain. It's a little bit, uh, say, the terminology is a little bit complex. Uh, if the numerical aperture is large, the lateral resolution becomes low. Okay, low means a larger value. But uh, by this, uh, we can increase the depth of focus, means the uh, imaging range. So it's a kind of compromise. So you need to find out the good balance based on your application. But first, you need to clearly aware about what you want to measure and then properly select the parameters when you design the OCD system. Okay. And, and also there is another factor here, lambda C, center wavelength. So this means the shorter the wavelength gives you a shorter the, a shorter the depth of focus. But uh, it's a power of one. That's a confocal radiation. And again, this effect of the lambda C is quite similar to that of lateral resolution. And it's a kind of compromise. Shorter the wavelength gives you a uh, smaller the depth of focus. Okay, but uh, the higher the lateral resolution. Okay. Uh, so um, let me conclude about the depth of focus issue. Depth of focus issue in the OCD or scanning OCD is uh, it is also called as a confocality. And it is uh, proportional to the second power of the effective numerical aperture and also uh, the power of one of center wavelength. So these two are significant factors of the confocality or depth of focus. And you need to think about it. You need to carefully consider it when you design the OCD system. Then let's go to the second limiting factor, sampling points, sampling limit. Oh, so uh, some, not sampling point, sampling limit, limit. And this is uh, only important for the fluid domain OCTs, not for time domain OCT. Okay. And let me remind you about the principle of the fluid domain OCT. In a fluid domain OCT, the signal is detected in a Fourier domain, I mean the spectral domain, right? And then it's digitized, discre uh, it's a discretely detected and digitized, okay? And then Fourier transform into the OCD domain. So there is uh, something like a certain limitation of the uh, detection bandwidth, uh, detection bandwidth, maybe not a good word, detection spectral width, and the spectral resolution, okay? The inverse of the pixel size or the pixel resolution of the spectral domain define the, the imaging depth. Okay? It's a kind of uncertainty. The size of the pixel in a spectral domain defines uh, the range after the free transform. And the range in a spectral domain defines the pixel fineness after the free transform, okay? It's a free transform uncertainty. The whole defines the part, and the part defines the whole. Okay, think about it. And now, when you think about the depth, uh, depth range of the OCT signal, it means the range in the OCT depth, you need to think about the, the resolution of the pixels of the spectrum. Okay, so then what's going to happen? The depth range, the maximum depth range of the FD OCD is defined by this equation. So in general, uh, it is inversely proportional to the, the, um, this guy, wave number per sampling point. It's a fineness of the spectral pixels. One pixel corresponds to delta K wave number with it. Okay. And because it's going to be fully transformed, we need to think about the inverse of it. Okay, the smaller or the finer the K resolution, resulting in the wider the depth range. It's inverse. 
And then we have two factors of one over two. Okay. The first half factor is a double bath effect. The light going to the tissue and a scattered back, now going back. So the uh, single, uh, okay, single length of the tissue uh, contribute double for the image. Okay, go and back. So this effect is accounted by this one over two. And uh, then what is this second one over two for? It's a FFD effect, Fourier transform effect, the numerical Fourier transform effect. Okay, you have uh, assumed you have 2000 pixels, original pixels in a spectrum and a Fourier transform. And you are going to have again the two, uh, 2000 pixels, right? But a half of it is a mirror of the other half the uh, numerical mirroring effect. So this means half the range should be discarded. Now you have only the thousand, okay? So we need to account for it. It's a one over two, the second one over two. Well, this is also uh, can be understood as a Nikes limit, okay? The Nikes frequency or is half the inverse of delta k, right? So it's the same, actually. The same thing uh, from the two perspectives, numerical perspective and the theory perspective. So in any way, we have two one over twos, and then uh, the delta z, the depth range, is in proportional to one of the delta k. And then uh, this delta k can be expanded in the lambda form as I... Uh, I think that's, uh, no, no, I, I didn't do it. Uh, maybe you can think about a derivative of K, K lambda equation, okay? And then uh, this equation can be rewritten as uh, like this part, okay? And then I'll clean up in this form. Okay, here, delta lambda, small delta lambda is a bandwidth, uh, bandwidth, no, no, sorry, the uh, small delta lambda is a sampled wavelength range. It's not the bandwidth of the light source, but a, a range of the spectrometer. It's too, uh, too deep. It's not the hard, uh, it's not the FWHM of the light source, but uh, the uh, total bandwidth of the spectrometer, not the light source, okay? So maybe uh, you, you can assume uh, you have 2,000 pixels in a spectrometer, okay? And the first pixel and the last pixel corresponds to certain wavelengths, okay? And a small delta lambda is uh, the width from the first to the last pixels in a wavelength, okay? Is divided by the number of pixels. In our, uh, in, in our ex um, example, it's 2,000. But in, anyway, uh, delta lambda divided by n, okay, it's a, I'm, I'm talking about an inverse. Okay, this one is an inverse of delta lambda divided by n, and the delta lambda divided by n is a uh, uh, wavelength uh, range per pixel. Okay, one pixel wavelength resolution is an uh, inverse of this, is this one. Okay, the finer the wavelength resulting in a smaller, the finer the uh, finer the wavelength band per pixel resulting in a larger this arm because it's inverse. And it results in a larger the depth range with this part of the equation. Okay, that's the depth range issue. If you capture the, uh, uh, if you capture, uh, sorry, sorry, if you have a finer pixel resolution of the spectrometer, you are going to have the uh, larger maximum depth imaging range. That's the point. But at the same time, uh, the depth imaging range is also limited by the other two factors, okay? And uh, even the, the highest factor, mainly. So you need to uh, surely consider about it. But uh, if the uh, measurement pixel resolution 
the, uh, the spectral pixel resolution is too low, you are going to have a lot of trouble for imaging uh, the sample with a deep depth range. Okay, so you need to always think about a power when you design the OCD system. Okay, then the final part of today's lecture is of uh, signal decay. Okay. The Fourier domain, in a case of Fourier domain OCD, the signal is decaying along the depth because of the limited resolution of the spectrometer. Okay, so now uh, I'm talking about uh, two types of the spectrometer resolution. The one is a pixel resolution. That is something I've talked in the last slide. And now I started to talk about the optical resolution of the spectrometer. Okay, and uh, normally the optical resolution of the spectrometer um, are, is around in the same range with the pixel resolution. But in, anyway, these two are different issues. Okay, uh, one wavelength as a delta function is going to be spread in a, a certain pixels, something like a Gaussian in a spectrometer. It's at the optical resolution of the spectrometer. Okay, so if you want to make a, a infinitely high resolution of the spectrometer, you need to uh, image the single wavelength into a delta function on the detector of the spectrometer. And it is not possible, right? So the imaging resolution of the spectrometer itself limits the resolution, spectral resolution of the spectrometer. And it results in, again, the decaying of the signal, the free transform relationship smaller the optical resolution, uh, the higher the optical resolution of the spectrometer resulting in the uh, wider the imaging range. It's totally the opposite of the resolution, depth resolution of the OCD. Wider the bandwidth resulting in the smaller the point spread function. That's the axial resolution of OCD, right? Now something similar happened, but in the opposite direction, the depth range signal decay. Uh, for example, here I took on the, on the picture from uh, the figure from the light gates paper 2003. So here is a zero delay in the OCT, and the signal is quite high. But uh, when you uh, shift the signal or the, uh, change the, the depth of the reference mirror, the signal started to decrease. Okay, then how does it decrease? So the decay with it. Um, defined by this half width, actually it's defined as a half width, defined log of two divided by pi is, and the n is a refractive index of the sample. Okay, and uh, this one is a center wavelength in a power of two divided by the, the resolution, optical resolution of the spectrometer. And I'm not going uh, down into details of the theory of this equation, but I'm going to utilize the similarity with this equation with the axial resolution of the OCD. I've already discussed about it previously. Okay, these two equations, uh, sorry, uh, here is the uh, axial resolution equation of the OCD, and it is quite similar to uh, this equation, right? LN2 divided by pi n is here, right? And uh, lambda c squared divided by delta lambda. So this one is a resolution of the spectrometer, but uh, this one is a bandwidth of the light source. The difference is here. And another factor is here, two, before ln2, okay? So the difference between this small delta lambda and the capital delta lambda is quite, uh, quite evident, right? what we are talking about is uh, uh, originally we are talking about uh, the bandwidth of the spectrum and uh, its free transform uh, defines the uh, axial resolution. And now we are thinking of the resolution of the spectrometer. It defined that uh, uh, the depth emission range or the depth, uh, the signal decay after the free transform. So we just swap it. And then what is this too? It is um, simply the definition of the width. Okay, 
on a signal decay is defined by the half width. Okay, because we use only the half the range for the imaging in the OCT. But uh, in the definition of the resolution, the center is center, and we define the resolution with the full width. Okay, so here is full width, and here is a half width. To account for it, we need two only for the definition of the resolution. Okay, as uh, once you understood it, it's quite easy and uh, straightforward. Okay, the theory itself, uh, you can uh, check the theory of the axial resolution. It's quite ubiquitous in the literature. Okay, so uh, maybe, uh, uh, anyway, it's a kind of good time to close the, the lecture. Okay, uh, today uh, I was talking about two topics. One is the selection of the wavelength for the OCD system, and the second is uh, signal decay. Okay, and uh, today is the fourth installment of this lecture. And the first, in the first installment, I explain about the basic concept and the principle of OCD. And uh, second lecture, I explain a little bit more mathematics, okay, and the resolution issues. And uh, in the third installment, uh, sorry, the second installment, I also talked about the selection of the interferometer. In the third installment, I explained the resolution issues and the sensitivity. And now uh, you know about the signal decay depth range and also the wavelength selection. Based on these knowledges, actually you can design your own OCT, at least on the paper. You need to think about a funding to build it, but at least it's quite fun to design a OCT, rough OCT system for your purpose. And it can be very educative. And uh, please try it. Okay, now you're ready to design, a basic, make a basic design of the OCT system. For each parameter, you can explain logically why you selected this parameter now. Okay, uh, so uh, let's close uh, today's lecture. And uh, so far in uh, four installments, I've talked about the principle of the OCT. And uh, maybe in the next lecture, actually, uh, this is the last of the five streams of OCT, uh, fundamentals of OCT. I'm going to talk about uh, an application and extension of OCT. So uh, now you can forget about the mathematics uh, for the last series and the last installment of this lecture. But uh, uh, you can expect some of the more images, the practical images of the OCTs. Okay. So uh, then let's close this lecture. So do you guys have uh, any question, comments? Fine. Okay. So then uh, let's close this lecture. Thank you. <laughs>